So look, there's five key strategies for how we can lead innovation for better learning. Innovation is not just about step one, focusing on problems worth solving. You know, innovation that's meaningful and that matters. We've also got to move to being inspired, having new ideation by pursuing inspiration without borders, taking the time to see the best of what's out there and being inspired by it. Number three, innovating in the real world, that we'd embrace disciplined innovation, working in pockets, incubating our promising practices, making sure they're really working with our leading educators in our most innovative stages and grades. The next step in innovation is to work out how to get it to spread. And so number four, how do you activate demand for promising practices? Activate demand for promising practices. You see, once it's working, the big problem for us is often these innovative practices are still only happening in certain pockets within our school, certain pockets within our district. And so the work of the innovative leader who really wants to bring better learning empowered by digital resources to every young person is to work out how do I get those practices moving from one classroom to another, from one stage to another, from one faculty to another, maybe from one school to another. And here, I think what we learn from other sectors in innovation is that we should focus much more on the demand side than on the supply side. And by that I mean that teachers don't change their practice unless they actually demand this new practice, unless they see it as being better for them, better for their students, simpler, and that it creates value for them and helps them really get out the end of the day, out of the door and think, you know, I've got more energy and I had a bigger impact today. And so how do we really think about this? How do we ensure that we're activating this demand from teachers for promising practices? A few quick thoughts. Number one, it's about making sure these practices are simple, reliable and effective. Uh, sometimes I'll talk to an educator who isn't all that keen on using the, the tablets or the computers or the, the devices that have been given to him or her. And I'll say, well, why aren't you using them? You know, tell me a little bit about it. You know, being driven by empathy and having a human-centered design approach. And typically they'll tell me a story of when they planned up a new lesson harnessing these devices. But actually 10 minutes into the lesson, only half of the kids could get on, and another half couldn't get logged on, two of the batteries weren't actually charged, and they just think, you know what? This is not reliable. We all know what it's like 10 minutes into a lesson. If we don't have structure, if we're not getting really moving into the, into the content, moving into deeper learning. And rather in the end, he or she is typically trying to deal with behavior management and come up with half a lesson for the group who can't get online or who can't log on properly to do while the other ones carry on with the lesson that was originally planned. Look, maybe you haven't had that experience yet. But there's a lot of lack of reliability, actually, in some of the ways that we've set up this infrastructure. And teachers sometimes go back to the analog ways of doing things because it's more reliable or it's simpler. And so what we need to do is to think, well, actually, how do we activate the demand for teachers for these devices, these new approaches, by ensuring that the models we create, these promising practices, are really simple? Number two, that they're reliable. And most importantly, that they're effective that students are more engaged, they're doing deeper learning, they're working more effectively than without them. And until we really work that out, we shouldn't expect that teachers just jump on board with the digital bandwagon because they really need to be convinced of that. They need to know what are we asking them to do? Why does it matter for student learning? And how they can actually do it in their own practice. I think we could also activate demand by really creating a more open culture of sharing about the great practices that are happening. Whether this happens in common room meetings, staff meetings, where people have an opportunity to share their practice and share the student work that's being produced, to activate a demand as teachers look upon that and say, wow, that's interesting. You know, those students are the same age as mine, the same grade level as mine. Look at the work they're producing. I'm not getting an opportunity for my students to produce work like that. Maybe I am interested in some of these uh, new opportunities for learning. Uh, sometimes it can have through less, happen through lesson observation, where a teacher who isn't utilising a lot of the devices gets an opportunity to go and observe another teacher who is effectively using these promising practices. But not that this teacher can sort of sit there and watch this innovative practice happen and just you know, somehow by osmosis uh, be transformed into an educator that can use them. No, rather, actually give them a really important role. Ask them to go and give meaningful, timely feedback to this educator about what they're seeing going on in the classroom. Let them do some type of lesson evaluation, lesson observation. Be thinking seriously about the learning that they're noticing. 
because that type of opportunity sustains their status and power as an expert educator, but lets them also have a very deep learning experience because as you do a lesson evaluation or observation for someone else, you're thinking deeply about learning and therefore you're also getting an opportunity to say, well, how is this person designed learning enabled by technology? And of course, in the back of their mind, they're hopefully getting an opportunity to think, what that, might that mean for me? So the, the fourth stage of uh, innovative uh, thinkers and leaders is always about moving from those promising practices developed in stage three where you embrace discipline innovation and moving towards activating the demand for these promising practices. Because unless teachers want to do them, unless they see that they're good and that they work and they can have more of an impact with them, it's very unlikely for them to spread beyond those pockets. Thank you.